week. If you're new, glad to have you. If if you ran off and you're enjoying spring break instead of being here, then they're lost. Last week we were talking about kind of the beginning of talking about the heartbeat of God, listening to the heartbeat of God, and what I had done is there's a famous Rembrandt picture that uh, of the prodigal son, the dad with the son on his knees hugging him, and a lot of people have questioned through the years why that picture is that way, and probably it's that way because the son is listening to the heartbeat of his father. So the correlation is, and the book we're using is um, listening to his heartbeat and kind of learning how to do that. So tonight we're going to be in Genesis, and just Genesis, well, you know, there's always a few others maybe, but... Um, the idea with, we'll get to the heart, we'll get to something in a second. So Genesis reveals that God is in control of life, not just the lives of the people such as, such as Adam and Eve and Noah, but he is in control of the people like me, like you and me. And I don't know about you all, but one thing I think that we sometimes do is we read the Bible and we read, for God so loved the world. And it's great and it's right but we really should be reading for God so loved blank and insert your name because it's really about God loving individual people and we'll get back to that in a second. Jack Evans Jr. Who saw him right after lunch at Affirming the Faith? Was that the guy oh, that was in, the, oh, in the gym? No, the, uh, in the auditorium that was, he was a little fired up. I wish I could do what he did, but he said maybe the best statement I've ever heard in all my life in, in being a Christian. He said he would much rather have a God not up in the heavens and beyond the blue, but a God here and that's guiding his footsteps. And I thought, how profound is that? Because God is God, however we look at it, but it's distant to think of God being up there rather than being here. So first, someone asked me last week if I was going to do Jeremiah 9, 13 through 16, and I said, wait, that's next week. Um, so what it says is that the Lord says, because they have forsaken my law that I have set before them and have not obeyed my voice or walked in accord with it, but have stubbornly followed their own hearts and have gone after Baal's, as their fathers taught them, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed this people with bitter food and give them poisonous water to drink. I will scatter them among the nations whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. So what is all that saying? It's saying God desires for us to choose to follow his heart. If we do not make that choice, quite simply, we'll fall short. I had will fail in there, and my wife said fail's a little bit strong, so um, fall short. Won't quite make it. So this is where you guys are going to start talking. Let's think about all the main characters throughout Genesis. And we're going to come to an agreement before we start naming names. So the key character in Genesis is who? God. God. God is. <laughs> uh, we need to separate you two because she's the one last week that made fun of my odyssey. It was, it was a great line. But, so God is not only the major character, but in... The fit, there's 50 chapters, so in 47 of the 50 chapters, God is mentioned 450 times. It's the most usage of any single character in the Bible throughout. Now, some people have a problem. I don't really think God is a character, but he is a key element in Genesis before we start naming other names. So, this is where you talk. Throw out some names. Moses, Abraham, um, Moses, Abraham Noah... Did I miss one? Adam. 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 Ad, who's with Adam? Eve. Eve. And who's with Adam and Eve? The serpent. The serpent. Can't leave out the serpent. I read an article today that said the serpent is the most important character in that story because sin is always there. 
Adam and Eve may not be in our life, but the serpent and sin always is. So, who else? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Jacob Isaac. Isaac. Abraham. Abraham. Lamech. Lamech or Lamech? Okay. Okay. Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Yep. Joseph. How about Laban? Do you know what Laban did? Made Jacob, now I got to tell you, wives are great, but I'm not sure about this 14-year thing. Um, so he worked, you know, seven years, and then the father deceived him and gave him the other daughter, and then he worked another seven years for the right daughter. I just can't imagine, but. <laughs> so King, King Abimelech, and probably King Abimelech in the, in Genesis is multiple King Abimelechs, but. Um, Lots of different guys and all that. So we'll come back to that in just a second. So what is the heartbeat of, of God from Genesis? What do you think about when you think about the heartbeat of God? It's a plan in motion for Jesus to come. Yep. It's all a plan throughout time involving Genesis. Way back when... You know, no one, I don't think you could even question the God being where he's at. Because Genesis 1 1 says, in the beginning, God created. Number one, you have God and you have creation. I, I think I said last week, evolution just makes me scratch my head. Because evolutionists want you to think that there's, there's, their way makes sense. And I got to tell you, they take a whole lot of steps and you got to believe this and you got to take, you know, this is just a little to the side. God's plan is right down through time, through history, through the Bible, through everything. So every person we mentioned either accepted or declined guidance from God. It's a choice. Not every character is good. We know that. So what do you think the heartbeat of God is in Genesis? I know I'm simple-minded, but I think the heartbeat of God in Genesis is the people. I think it was very personal in Genesis. In, in, in person, yep. I mean, that book to me is more than anywhere else throughout the Bible. He had personal relationships with yep. the people, one-on-one. Is there any, we sometimes call them DBS stories. And I hope that's not offensive to anybody. But if you went to VBS as a child, you know what I'm talking about. So the main stories that people know and can recite, you know, Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, Abraham's a pretty big one. Everybody knows Noah in the ark, Jonah and the whale, you know, on and on and on. But with VBS stories, the interesting thing is on every single one of them, there's a starting point of God and his relationship with the people. And when those people leave that relationship or start to question that relationship, they are going to, it's going to get bad for them in multiple ways. So help me out. So we're going to try to figure out stories that you know fairly well. So Genesis is broken up into four categories. And uh, to give it away, the first one is creation. The second one is Abraham. The third one is Jacob. And the fourth one is Joseph. So if you look at Genesis as a whole, it really divides itself up well. So when you think of creation, what do the first 11 chapters represent? And you can cheat in your Bible, I don't care. I'll make fun of you later, but it's all right. So what else is around creation? What's involved with creation? What's your favorite part of creation? When God walked among Adam and Eve and had a personal relationship. Yep, with them. I agree. I really love the God, the idea of God looking at His creation and saying it's good. You know, you you all that cook in the kitchen. There is an occasional time when you eat the food that you've just cooked and you think, that's really good. There may be other times that you think, Bleh. 
God looked at what he had done and he said, it's good. And if it pleased God, it's, it's got to please us. So creation is an interesting thing because I think we walk out and we see creation every day. How can you not walk out and think that God or some being created the world around us? Best weather ever right now. Guess what we had about five days ago. This has been the craziest Oklahoma weather I think I've ever known. I'm wearing shorts one day and I'm bundled up in a jacket worried about going to work in snow and ice the next. But guess what? It's all God's creation. So what else about man or anything else? So Adam and Eve, what was the problem? The problem was sin. Actually, here's what people sometimes say. It was Eve's fault. All of our fall and problem with sin is Eve's fault. Is that right? Well, that's where it began. It did begin there, but Adam certainly had a choice. Oh, I, know. Yeah. I, I The thought that we're going to blame it on one sex because they ate of it first just doesn't jive with me. If, we also don't know how long they have been there. You're exactly right. Yep. You know, time is a real factor in Genesis, and especially the first part of Genesis, because we really don't understand, don't know, and will never know the exact time frames we're talking about. How long the days were. And I still can't get past the fact that he was talking to a snake and listening to a snake. Yeah, wouldn't you choose, I mean, I'm just being silly here, but I would choose like an aardvark or a hippo <laughs> or something. A giraffe would be cool to talk to, but a snake? On the ground, who likes snakes? <laughs> they serve a purpose. And, and there's a reason, I think, that God made it a snake. What are snakes? What, what is it about snakes that make you think of evil? The devil. <laughs> the devil? The fact that they have no arms and legs? Well, they, and yeah, they slither. Uh, you know, snakes are, and I, snakes are cool, but not everybody likes snakes. In college, this is a carry thing, sorry, but in college we had a chicken snake in our room, in a dorm room, and we'd hide it every night when the RA would come. And Carrie one night came in past curfew, <clears throat> just a little bit. I didn't do that very often. <laughs> but Mr. Snake in the dark was in my bed. And I sat and laid right on Mr. Snake. And I promptly took Mr. Snake up, picked him up and threw him across the room. He hit the wall and he was no longer alive. So when I'm walking out with Mr. Snake and he's dead, the hall director catches me and I think I had, well, I know I, I had to go to the dean the next day because I had a snake in my room. But. Um, so what else about Genesis, the first part of Genesis? Cain and Abel. What about simply, why do we mention one brother more than we mention the other? Okay. Yes. <laughs> That's, that was kind of the easier one to be. They, he killed his brother. He's gone. So the other ones. Do what? Had a lot of descendants. Yep. Founded a city. Yep. So one major thing we're going to come back to over and over is good can still come out of evil. If you don't believe that, you really don't understand God. Because there is always going to be good that comes out of evil. And I hope you can see it in your own life. I think you probably do. Uh, I certainly know that at times I didn't always walk like God wanted me to walk and otherwise. So in Genesis... In Genesis 1 through 11, we're going to talk about the main character, God's role, God appears, and the focus of that section. So it's God, main character. God's role is direct to the people. God appears in person. And this is really, it just doesn't happen a lot in the Bible because God may appear occasionally, but not necessarily all the time. And God appears in 1 through 11. And then the focus is 
for all mankind, it's universal. Does everybody shake your head? Yes, that makes sense. So now Abraham. What about Abraham? What do we know? How old was he when we met him? He was old. He, he was probably around 75 or 80. Uh, it's just amazing to me that a true leader of God is old before we ever meet him. And when we meet him, he's not Abraham. He was Abram. And of course, Sarah was Sarai and all of that. So what about Abraham do we know? Yep. Haran. Yep. Fully trusted. Yep. That's a big one. Do we fully trust in God? I would love to say yes, but I'm not sure humankind knows how to these days very well. What else about Abraham? We know he's the father. Someone said something I didn't hear. Yes. Yep. So is Abraham good? Yes, but he had his moments. He did. And back to the thing that good can come out of evil. Because when you follow Abraham and you get into those, and I know it's a, a curry thing, but you get into those uh-oh moments that you think, what is he thinking? He returns back to God. And good comes out of evil. So... When we're talking about, that's 12 through 25, so Abraham's the main character. God's role is direct at times, and at times he's a mediator. So what the writer of this book did that I didn't really like, but it, maybe it helps explain his viewpoint, he, think, he takes it as a, a four-part play. And he says the first part is everybody's on stage, including God. And then the second part, God's off stage, And the third part... You know, he has all these things. It was not necessarily the way I would explain it. But uh, the interesting thing is as God appears, he's not necessarily physical, but it's in dreams and as angels. And then the focus is really on the family. When we talk about Abraham, I think we all think of him being a family man. And look at all the descendants that we're now going to talk about from now on that descended from Abraham. So the third one is Jacob. So what do we know about Jacob? He did have 12 sons. What did God promise Jacob? Yep. Those 12 sons with and I know it gets complicated and all with tribal situations and all that, became leaders of the people that they were with. Again, one guy, of course married, but one guy is now the founding father of a large amount of people. Who was raised with a lot of brothers and sisters? No, someone in here. Anybody? We had four in our family, and I know there's bigger families than that. I've I've had a couple people that have come in to search for a tour or whatever. We had one family that uh, I asked her. We were talking where they lived, and they were from Lincoln, Nebraska, and she said she has 24 kids, and I thought she was kidding. She had 13 of her own, and the rest were adopted, and they drove around in this extended, not even minivan, a people mover, and, I mean, all the kids came in, and two's okay. Emily used to, re <laughs> Emily used to really want a brother or sister, and we told her to go be with babies, so that's now her job, um, because we weren't having any more kids. But, so, Jacob. He, God spoke directly to Jacob. He, again, God appears in dreams and, fam and angels, and we're still focusing on the family and that 
descendants from Jacob are going to carry on Christi- carry on God. I almost said Christianity, and some people might argue with that. So, carried on God. So the last is Joseph. So tell me everything you know about Joseph, and you can do it shortly. Yep. Why was he Jacob's favorite? That's the key. Favorite wife's first son. Yep. His favorite wife's first son, which we don't necessarily know how to deal, deal with that, but in Bible times, there might have been many wives and many kids from the many wives. And on top of that, we're in a period of time where not only were there wives, but there were also uh, maid servants, concubines, and other people that are having guys' babies. I can't imagine. But favorite wife, favorite son from that wife. Uh, what else? Why, because of that, what did Jacob do that was probably not the best idea? He was, he was special, and the brothers knew it. I, I always tried, when my kids were young, to tell one of them that they're my favorite, and when the other one comes in the room, you're my favorite. <laughs> Depends on who's in the room at the same time, but I got to tell you, it becomes a problem as your family gets older and all that. What kid resembles what parent and who's what parent's favorite and all that. And I can't imagine the brothers and their feelings about Jacob obviously liking Joseph more than he did the others. And liking him so much, what did he give him? Coat of many colors. Love the picture. Don't wear a coat of many colors, but I think it'd be cool. But again, separate. So the brothers decided to do what? Yeah, their, their original plan was to kill him, and whether they weaned out or whatever, they... Yep. I, I, I absolutely, yes. So they wound up selling him to traveling whatever. I used to, I'd like to call it traveling encyclopedia salesman, but some of you aren't old enough to remember people that come knock on your door, so uh, it did happen. The, the thing is, is that selling or whatever, trading your brother to other people that you don't know is pretty extreme. So what did they have to do when they traded their brother? Their dad says they come back, he's around the tent or whatever, and dad says, where's Joseph? They, <laughs> we're, we're no different than that. Uh, I've said before, so little white lies don't stay little white lies for very long. Because what happens is you have to cover that little white lie and then you have to cover the other one. I don't really buy into little white lies. Lies are lies, but they get bigger and bigger to try to cover your face. And that's what happened with Jacob, 100% and Joseph. So, main character is Joseph, sorry. God's role is indirect. God appears, not at all. When I say not at all, I'm talking in, in person, in presence, <coughs> not not at all because Joseph walked with God. And the focus is family and universal, which is kind of, it's back to let's take this family idea and let's apply it to the rest of our lives is, and other people is, is essentially what we're doing. So Genesis is telling us that no matter how we encounter God, he is with us directing each step. Do you want to walk through life without the guidance of God? It, it kind of gets <clears throat> excuse me, to the heart of the matter that we see a lot through uh, the rest of the Bible, where it says, in those days, people just did what they wanted to do. Yep. They followed their own counsel, ran after their own heart, like now, Pam said. Mo- Monica, close your ears for a second. Mm-hmm. I loved... I don't know that I've ever been to a 
more touching funeral than the one this week. And there's something that is way cool about being able to stand up there, sit multiple people talking about her faith in her life and that she really walked the walk. And the thought of walking without God, I, you all have probably been to funerals, I have too, where people don't have God. It's sad when someone comes to a church or comes to search sometimes and they say, we've never been in a church building, but we know our loved one would like to be buried, have a funeral in a church service. Do you all have someone that can perform the ceremony? I got to tell you, it's hard to know what to say. You're not going to get that person in heaven because he's already lived his life and didn't make it probably. But they want that. They want you to save them all. And uh, I want, when it's time for me to go, I want the people around me to say, I lived a Christian life and not have to wonder where I was. So Joseph. <coughs> we talked about this. He's the son of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. Jacob. Jacob dotes over Joseph. I know my words sometimes. Just ignore him. Brothers upset and possibly jealous. Sell Joseph to traitors headed to Egypt. Joseph rises to position of power. Famine in Canaan happens. Jacob sent some of his sons to find food. When they went before Joseph, Joseph they did not recognize Joseph, which is kind of interesting to me. But they haven't seen him since a young boy, so very possible. Joseph reveals identity and moves family near. So we're going to turn over. Our text is really Genesis. We're finally the text. Uh, Genesis 50, 15 through 22. If someone could read it out loud. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake to him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto him, and to them, Fear not, for I am in the place of God. For am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore, fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived 110 years. So breaking down this, these verses. So what are the brothers worried about? Revenge. Revenge or retaliation? How many of you, especially, I'll talk to the guys, so... You do something against your brother and you run hide. And you, you may be hiding for your life because you know that there is retaliation coming. It's a human thing that happens to everybody. So they were worried that now that they're living and father is deceased and all that's happened, they are worried that Joseph is going to hold a grudge or settle a grudge, you probably could say. So they go and they say, our father asked us to deliver this message like us, even though we treated you wrong. And Joseph has one of the best answers I can imagine, because he basically says, none of that mattered. You're back with me. When you think about God, do we disappoint God sometimes on a daily basis? What does God promise to us? Mm -hmm. 
Yep, forgiveness welcomes us back. There used to be a Christian writer that wrote uh, oftentimes about forgiveness, and he says, God forgives and forgets. It's humans that often have a tougher time settling that. It is a great thought in my mind that God is there. I'm going to fall, and I'm going to fall short, and I'm going to fail, and I, all of the above. And God is there. Has been all my life and will continue to be as long as I allow him to. The dialogue begins with thoughts of fear and revenge, but end with insight into God and his heart. When we're really talking about the heart of God, I think what we're saying is the whole package. So he not only created and he sent his son, but he forgives. And you can't have sin and the love of God without also having forgiveness. Because I have, I'll just take it, the blame here. I've fallen enough that it could be that God could say enough's enough. But he doesn't say that. And he won't say that. As long as I am still on the right directional path. Verse 20. When he says, you could have evil, but God intended it for good. Doesn't that summarize a lot of what we're saying, not only in Genesis, but the whole Bible? There are things in life that are confusing, but God is not. Most most of the time when I teach Bible class, I look at you all like you're third graders or less. Because if I can explain it to a third grader, I can usually explain it to fifth graders like you all. <laughs> Not really. I did say fifth. I didn't say first or second. God did not make this stuff hard. Now, are there some difficult things in the Bible? Sure. You can, Dale and I probably can give you books. I love going to visit Dale because I go into his office and I don't have any material and I ask him what I think is a little question and I walk out with 14 books. <laughs> and every book in it says property of Dale Hartman or something like it. I can keep them. That's his wife. Y'all heard it. But here's the interesting thing. I, I don't, academia is great. And there are times for it. But the basic message of God is very simple. Do my will. Be faithful. And you have my forgiveness and love. When you think about the book of Ecclesiastes, and I, I love Ecclesiastes. So you have a guy that is trying all sorts of things to be happy or to be content. What does he try in Ecclesiastes? Everything. Everything. So he tries money, wealth. He tries fame. He tries good looks, which some of us don't really have to try that, right, guys? Um, he tries things that he thinks the world wants him to be. And what does he decide? It is all, whatever word you use, I, the Bible says folly. It is all not important. The last verses of Ecclesiastes say, fear, fear God and keep his commandments. And I, I really think that's what it's about. And, and I, I know people struggle with fear and talking about fearing God and all that. Fearing God is respecting him and wanting to do his will, not doing it because you're scared of the future. There's a difference between what the world sees as fear and what we define in Christianity as fear. God takes a malevolent deed and does something marvelous. So I had to work up, look up the word malevolent, not a word I use every day since I can't say it anyways. So malevolent is intended for evil. So God takes evil and makes something good come out of it. Any of you guys woodworking people? My favorite thing about woodworking is, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I need to ask, are any of you ladies or men woodworking people? Because the person that does the prettiest woodworking right now is sitting in class, and you can go see some of them. 
Audrey's pictures, but does better woodworking than me, and I think I do pretty good. But the reason I like woodworking is I can take a block of wood that doesn't have anything to it. In fact, I pick it up and I get shards and splinters and everything else. It may be smelly. Some of the wood I spin pins out of is smelly and oily, and I mean, it's not necessarily cool stuff as you're working with it, except you take that piece of wood and you make it into something beautiful. And it's kind of like life in that we take our sorry selves, sorry, and we turn them into what's beautiful to God. Joseph seems to know and understand the intent or heart of God. Do we, do you know the intent and heart of God? And if you do, how did you get that? Jesus? I would, I throw in, I say the Bible, because there's no, I don't think there's any true coming to God without at least making some stop-offs in the Bible, because the Bible is the instruction book. I know guys aren't very good. I'm the same dad that on Christmas Eve, you're putting together some type of kitchen or car or something for your kids, and who reads directions? I don't. You always wind up with 17 screws not in something, and you say, should these have gone somewhere? And when your kid falls out of something a week later, and the tire comes off. <laughs> the Bible is simply God's instruction, and we can know God's heart and his intent for us because the Bible says it so. The insight about God that comes at the last of Genesis is a theme, since we've said there's several themes. Humans act in evil ways, always have, always will. If you find someone that says they're perfect, they're lying. Now, I have known some people throughout my life that I have really thought were really close. And I discovered something about 10 years ago. I was hanging out with Mac Lyon in some way. And at the time, he was 80 and probably one of the best friends I've ever had. And my wife can attest to that. I just dearly love Mac. But he pulled me aside one day and he said, you're thinking wrong. I would say things like, you know, Mac, I know you're not perfect, but you're really close. And he told me, he said, I got to tell you the truth about that. He said, I, just like everybody else, have thoughts that I shouldn't have and have anger moments and, you know, ignore my wife and what, whatever else. I still struggle with daily life. And here I am thinking how wonderful he is and he still lacks something. So what the world does sometimes is they look at us and they think we're perfect. You guys go to church to be with other perfect Christians. And I want to shout from the rooftops, we really go to church as sinning Christians and try to be better tomorrow. It's not about being perfect today and trying to show everybody else you are. And secondly, God uses their actions to bring about good. And I put in their people because I had said in the beginning, people. God recasts human evil into good all the time. Conclusion, and that doesn't mean we're done, but um, God is working when visibly present and sometimes when seemingly absent. And we see that in Genesis because at times you see God, at times you hear God, and at times God is off stage, per se, but still acting. And if we always don't understand the answers to prayers, sometimes we don't even understand God. What is important about understanding God? We're to know for good. Yep. All yep. My, my strongest answer would be the idea of misinformation. If you don't try to know God and who he is, when the world around us tries to chip away at you, they're going to be able to easier than if you know God. 
And I got to tell you, it's a constant chipping. I don't, I'll pick on Scott too. <coughs> he and I both work in a fairly, I work in a very Christian area, but Scott works with some Christian people. I'm sure there are some not, but I have never worried. I work with Craig and his nephew and a couple other people, but I don't worry about going to the water cooler and worried about what someone says. And some of you do. And what does that mean? That means that you have to live sometimes where you're leaving the situation. I couldn't leave ball games when I was umpiring, and sometimes people were not necessarily friendly or Christian. Uh, I know that's a shock, but um, but with that said, we we have to see God even when He seems like He's not present. He really is. Who is God? Genesis gives us generous insight into his nature and his concerns. That one kind of made me wonder a little bit, does God have concerns? I think so. If God knows every hair on your head, and we talk about sin separating us from God, and that God abhors evil. You can put all those things with it. I think God is concerned about each and every one of us. Back to John 3.16, what does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave. And then very recently that reflected when it says, cast your cares on him. Right? Cares for you. Right? Yeah. And you could take several of those. You know, why would you pray without ceasing if prayer isn't, part of the whole thing. Why doesn't it say, go to church without seasoning? Hang out with Audrey doing woodworking without seasoning. We're brothers and sisters. and But it says pray without ceasing. Audrey's wondering about that one. <laughs> what is God like? Does that sometimes scare you to think, I think we should know what God is like, and some people get scared away that we're trying to guess, you know, not, not what God looks like, but what God is and what he does and why he does it and why we are still here. Genesis tells us that he wants to be known. Boy, you can't open up the Bible without seeing some type of passage that says God wants us in some way. He wants us to know him. Where is he when I need him? Genesis introduces, introduces us to the doctrine of God's control over the world. We may not see him, but he is always there. I already talked about that. Is he really interested in helping me, Carrie? He intends good. Exactly how that good plays out is explored in the next couple of weeks. Finally, remember the picture of the prodigal son and how he was listening to his father's heartbeat. The goal of this study is that we understand what we're listening to through Scripture. And before this, I don't know that I really spent a lot. I love when I look out and you guys are really thought, thinking. I've made your wheels turn. I don't, we don't have all the answers here, but if you leave here today and you think about something tomorrow, then we've done a good thing. So let's, next week, uh, we're still in Genesis, but talking a little bit about something about God's heart, heart and an intentional heart for us and, and him. So let's pray together. I, I'm going to make a small request. So my, my mom has had a very tough week, um, and we're having to make some rather tough decisions. She's having, probably showing some signs of dementia and other things, so... If we can keep her in our prayers, that'd be great. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for guiding our steps, for giving us your son, for giving us your word, that we can read from it, we can study from it, we can apply it to our lives. We love you so very much. We want to be more like you each day. We do ask that you be with all those that are sick and uh, going through things. We especially ask that you be with the Rao family and their recent loss. Uh, be with our family as uh, mom's trying to recover 
and having a tough time of it. But we do know that you give us love, you give us daily guidance, you give us support like we can't find any other way. We do thank you most of all for your son on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.